for that introduction, Jim. Because of the logistics, I'm going to be sitting during my talk today, so as the lights go off, uh, you won't be able to see me, but you'll be able to hear me, and you'll be able to see the slides up on the screen. So without further ado, I decided to start with a side time today. So for those of you who don't want to participate, that's fine. Uh, those of you who do, why don't you take a minute to check in with your posture, where you're seated, get relaxed, maybe loosen your belt buckle a little bit. Uh, check in with your feet on the floor for this opening part. You can have your eyes closed or open. And so now I'd like you to take a deep breath. Exhale deeply. One more time, deep breath in. Exhale deeply. Now I'd like you to turn your attention to your feet. Just check in, wiggle your toes. Now we're going to move our attention slowly up to the ankles. Then up through our calves, into our knees. Just kind of flex your knees a little bit. Check in with your knees. Bring your attention up both your thighs into your pelvis. Up into your intestine, your stomach. Let's just rest there for a moment with our attention. Now we're going to bring our attention up into our lungs and just notice the breath. Just be present with your breath. Now we're going to move our attention up to our shoulders and our neck. You want to move your head a little bit, just check in with the neck muscles. Just relax the neck, any tension you may have. And then let's take our attention and bring it down the shoulders, the arms to the elbows. Let's just rest at the elbows for a moment. Now we bring our attention down the forearms to our wrists, into our hands. Just wiggle your fingers a little bit or flex your fingers, just checking in with our body. Now we're going to bring our attention back up to our elbows up to the shoulders, through the neck, and let's rest right at the back of the head for a moment. There's an energy center back there. Let's check in. Now we're going to bring our attention around to the mouth, the nose, and the eyes, up to the forehead, and now we're going to rest right on the top of the head. We've covered our whole body. We're just going to rest in that for a second, just checking in, being present. Mm. And now, in our imagination, we're going to open up into our entity, we're just going to imaginatively widen our awareness above our head into our soul or the God of self. If your name is Emma, you would open to the God of Emma. It's a personalized version, your very personalized piece of all that is. Just open your awareness and just be present with the feeling tone of the God of self. You can't do this wrong. Just feel into that presence, that awareness. Acknowledge it. Open to it. Now, we're going to go even further inward. I'd like you to imagine a laser beam shooting right out of the top of your head up into the infinite embrace of infinity and open to all that is. And in this space of all that is, we are one. There is no separation in this room. There is no room. There is simply all that is. Just take a moment to feel into that part of yourself that's present right here, right now. And rest in that as that. Bring our 
our attention back to the God of self. It's a little bit narrower, but it's our own individual piece of the rock, as Jane Roberts called it. Our essence, our soul, our source, our eternal self. That's that. And now we're going to climb back down to our forehead, right to the top of the head, join in union back with our physical body, be present in the body, and feel the connection from the top of your head to the God of self to all that is. Allow it to resonate deeply. And finally, imagine a saran wrap sized blanket of energy surrounding your head like a mummy's blanket, coming around your head, coming around your neck, around your shoulders and your arms, your lungs down to your torso, wrapping you with its loving energy, down to your hips, around your legs, your thighs, to your knees, down your calves, to your ankles, and finally, to your feet. And open your eyes now, come back into the room, take a deep breath, Exhale. Just be present with that. Now we're ready for a story about following the beat of a different drummer. And I want to point out that you'll notice this year there's no PhD at the end of my name uh, because I'm going to tell some stories that I've never told publicly before, and they're very personal, deeply personal stories about my journey with the Seth material. But when the committee came up with the theme for this year's conference, it really was the perfect opportunity to publicly share this with you, so that's what I'm going to be doing today. There will be several musical interludes to kind of break up the rational stuff that I go through. Uh, but this will be very much the magical self today talking, and that's why I did this side time to open up the magical self, because I'm really addressing that part of everybody in the room today with these stories. So my background, I was born into a secular family. My father was an electrical engineer, an average middle class family, but I did not have a strong religious background. So I had to find that myself, and Carlos Castaneda's books were uh, Castaneda's books. Provided that, and of course in the early 1970s, I was exploring drugs and altered states. And I only realized this in hindsight, that these are my natural shamanic tendencies because I do not recommend ex experimenting with drugs to the young ones at all. It's very dangerous, and unless you have a guide, a teacher, to walk you through these altered states and point out the healthy energies that you will encounter, as well as some of the negative energies that you will encounter. Uh, it can be very dangerous. So this is, in the 70s, I'm in my teens. I'm just getting into my version of spirituality. And in 11th grade, in my philosophy class, my philosophy teacher introduces me to Thoreau's Walden. And by the way, I need to point out in the program, it says who Seth considered a speaker. I researched that. And it was Emerson, not Thoreau, but they were contemporaries, and I think it applies to Thoreau as well. But this quote, if a man loses pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. That blew me away, and it just became an internalized theme for my own hero's journey that continues to this day. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to put a plug in for Joanne's talk following this one, because she will be talking about your hero's journey in more detail than I will today. But she gave me a framework to at least organize my storytelling as I'm going through these stories with you. And 
basically my hero's journey, of course, you start with a departure. And this was used uh, by George Lucas in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's story, and his father. And initiation is the second phase, and that's pretty much where I am to, at this point in my journey. So we don't hit the return. That's still an improbable future for me. And I realized that in the Seth material, his idea of the practicing idealist is our own personalized version of our hero's journey. So when you read the material about the practicing idealist from in mass events, the individual, and the nature of mass events, that's Seth's version of the hero's journey. OK, moving on. In May of 1976, I first run into Seth Speaks, and it blows my mind. I read that book, and within the first hour, I had an epiphany. I knew this was important. Something was resonating. And in my 11 years of doing email lists, dozens of people came in and said Seth Speaks was the first book that they read and had a similar resonance to it. So just a show of hands, how many people in the room today, Seth Speaks was their first Seth book that they read? Right, so at least half of the room. And how about Nature of Personal Reality, the other bestseller as, as the first book that they may have read? Yeah, that's another, another big one. So of course, after that, I rushed to buy everything I could get my hands on. And for the next several years, I read the Seth material, the Nature of Personal Reality twice, Oversoul 7, which to this day remains my favorite of all of Jane's work. And the Unknown Reality, uh, Volume 1 and 2, were published by the late 70s. And let's see here, the practice elements. This, is a ver this was very difficult, but Seth speaks, the Seth material, Unknown Reality, Sets, or, and the nature of personal reality sets you up for these uh, very difficult books. There are 17 practice elements in there. I tried to do them as best I could. And it's the closest thing, and I've said this before, to a Sethian yoga that there is in there. If you do all of this work, it provides a conceptual framework for when you have altered states to begin to interpret what happens. And I just wanted to tell a little story, too, about when I read about the counterparts and then the families of consciousness in Unknown Reality Volume 2. I was really bummed because I totally resonated with Sumafi because I was I know I'm an educator. That's that's my thing that I was born to do. It was it's what I do. It's what I do well without even trying. And so of course the Seth phenomenon was all about Sumari, right? And Sumari singing and Sumari in the class and so I thought I was screwed. <laughs> but that changes later in the journey. Sethi Cat is the cute little Siamese on the right. I just included him. And Kaiser is the one looking at us. He's seven years older. But in the summer of 76, when I got Seth Speaks, I was so taken by it, I named this cute little eight-week-old Siamese cat Seth. And uh, he's a beloved monster of my own. So as I progressed in, in my studies with this, this quote always stood out to me. You must first of all cease identifying yourself completely with your ego and realize that you can perceive more than your ego perceives now. For those who don't know what the ego, the definition of the ego is simply that, that the part of yourself that you identify with your name. So Paul is my ego self. Everything that I associate with Paul, my needs and desires is Paul. But what Seth points out is that we're multidimensional beings. We all know this. We were just opening to our own sense of that, and ways to connect with that. And psychological time is the inner sense that is a gateway to the inner self, and that's a tagline to Dream Bob's book, Lucid Dreaming, the gateway to the inner self, and it's just a different way of saying that. But psi time just is, is the crucial modality. It opens the door for all meditation practice and altered states. So in the beginning of 1979, three years, almost three years after, I started to do a dream journal. My New Year's resolution was, I'm going to keep a dream journal. That's what Seth is all about. It's a great practice thing to keep your dreams and record them. And I'm so glad I have uh, because you, as the years go by, you look back at your dreams and, and they change. The fish get bigger, right? As the years go by, and you tell the story, oh, it's huge. It was much bigger. And you go back and read, oh, it was very different. And it, it grounds you in your memory of your own subjective experience. All of which to say that at December of uh, 79, I had a powerful two and a half hour lucid dream. It was my first breakthrough. Leading up to that, I had had five dreams that I recorded, and they were only about five seconds of lucidity. I'm, I'm doing practice elements, I'm, I'm recording.
supporting my dreams. I'm in graduate school. I'm doing music at this time. And this happened during semester break, so my mind was relaxed, and I reread the Oversoul 7 book. I believe that's on this next slide. And Supernatural Aid is part of the first stage of the hero's journey. And my girlfriend at the time's mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so this was devastating. And I point this out to say that these shocks that we get in life have a double edge and a silver lining at times because it forced me to ask a deeper question and to be open to the answer. And goddamn, if the inner self didn't take a baseball bat and smack me and had two and a half hours worth. And the reason I know is that because in the bed I was sleeping at my girlfriend's grandmother's house, she had a cuckoo clock. So I could keep track of time. I, I remembered four and I remembered 6.30. So it was about that time, that much time. As that experience was happening, my first breakthrough experience, I realized with great joy that I was in the middle of something that was new and exciting. But I wasn't afraid because of the work I had done and the framework I had. So I would come back in the body in bed. I'm in the vibrational state. I'm aware that I'm in the bed. And then zip, right back in wherever I was going. And it continued. And that's just a little point on dream yoga. And I want to read a dream journal as I reflected on that. And I did not have my journal up there with me. There was one point where I looked at my arm and pinched it, and it hurt, just like Proteus in Oversell 7, who had an out of body and noticed when he pinched it, it hurt. There was one episode during which I was talking to my girlfriend and pointing out that we were both in our astral bodies, and it was based on physical properties. At one point, I looked down at my left arm, and there, tattooed in clear blue, were bunches of Sumari symbols, just like those in the Oversoul 7 book. I didn't know what they were at the time. I made this connection only after waking up and recalling that part. At another point, I found myself inside of an elevator. I wanted to get out of there, and I knew I could go right through the wall, and I attempted to do so. But I kept hitting the ceiling and bouncing back gently, up and back. The physics of the situation, I didn't quite understand it. Then I remembered something. I realized I was going to, all, the only way I was going to get out of the elevator was to imagine a different scene, just like Sumter had done in the Dream Tribunal or Ma'a when she went out of body to the outside of the speaker city. And as soon as I did that, the scene simply changed. Now, the reason I bring that up is I had this framework of these stories. And I started experimenting with the stuff that I was reading about in a science fiction book, and it worked. So this, you know, experience just totally blew me away. Just a few weeks later, I say I meet Seth in quotes. I have a lucid dream, and it's back at my childhood home. And in many of these cases, where we first become lucid early on are familiar, friendly environments, a family place, a grandparent's place, a place where there's a lot of love and safety. And I became lucid on my neighbor's lawn, and on the other neighbor's lawn was an old man, an older man figure, an archetype. And I demand to my entity in the sky, I want to meet Seth. So instantly I come over to this old man, and as I look up, Face to face, he does this oversaw seven where he changes all these focuses in the blink of an eye. Dozens of cells. And the energy was very startling to me. And this just happened in the dream. You know, it was only after awakening and reviewing it, writing about it, and reflecting on it that I made the connection that this was one made of many. These were different focuses and, and essence, some sort of essence. Now, these are my interpretations, and I offer them to you, and I'm open to your own experiences with these as well, and I hope we can discuss that at some point here. And now we're going to give our brains a rest.
Meanwhile, back at the ranch, after these big experiences early on, this big breakthrough, I really had no framework, social framework, to fit this into, no community or friends who were doing this, no connections. So by the 80s, early 80s, really real life took over. I got married, but in 1985, we split up amiably. We had no kids in that marriage. And I have to share that I was told during that breakup that I didn't believe in God. And I had shared these experiences with my ex-wife. And, you know, she, she was nodding with interest during these things. But I guess she thought I was crazy. And maybe I was. Maybe I still am. But I know in this room I can tell these stories. And you don't think I'm crazy, do you? No. <laughs> we can laugh about it here. So the initiation, the second... The second part of the hero's journey, after that wake-up call to action and you're thrust out of your village, your comfort zone, your familiar life, and you're off and running, I had a very difficult transition in my divorce, and I was in such deep pain at one point for about 24 hours that I got to that place where suicide was an option. The pain was so deep. You know, what can I do to make this stop? You get to that point. The amazing thing was, in hindsight, because of my beliefs and my experience with Seth, I knew that suicide was not an option. Because I would have to deal with whatever I was dealing with immediately on the other side. And Seth is very clear about that. So this is an interesting point about the material and its power as we deal with our life crises. I also had another very powerful lucid dream during this time. The MILs, my mother-in-law, who had passed from her cancer finally. And uh, it was very powerful because I, essentially, she was standing over a casket draped in a flag. Now, my father, ex-father-in-law was a veteran. I never met him. Was, again, only after waking up and analyzing this with my rational mind, I realized that was his presence. She was standing over his casket and I asked my mother-in-law, are we going to reconcile and continue? And she said, no. And these golden tears were coming out of her eyes onto the casket. And I knew I had to move on. So I began dating in 1986. And I had a group of friends. There were four or five, and we were a wolf pack. And I'm 31 years old and going to bars and going out. and. It wasn't that great, actually. I had some good times, of course, but the women that I met in that phase with my wolf pack were less than desirable, <laughs> to say the least. And the funny part of that, the typical thing was, you know, my buddies would say, hey, check this guy out. He's a doctor. And they'd come over to me and say, oh, you're a doctor. What are you talking about? You know, music. Um, you know, no money. No money there. No money in the music. <laughs> so after a year, I threw in the towel. I just said, fuck it. <laughs> fuck it all. I've had it. And you know, at that moment, it's a moment of surrender. And this angel came into my life. So we, we got together in 1987, and this started my science museum period, where I was blinded by science. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. Science museums are awesome. There's so much spirit in, in a science museum that they just don't even see it. They can't, they're so blinded by it. I did a wonderful exhibit, had a great time. My father passed away in early 1991. It was another big change. And I will share a brief dream. Uh, it was very difficult. My younger brother and father had difficulties in their relationship and he was younger brother was very angry that my father did not leave an inheritance to us and that my stepmother inherited the money and for me from my point she dealt with my father and, and my grandparents she earned every penny of it I had no claim to it this was my position and it remains to this day and my older brother's similar but my younger brother had an issue with this well, this lucid dream takes place at my grandparents' place, my father's parents' place that we grew up in. And there's my father, and he tells me to tell Eric that he will get his share in no uncertain terms. 
So of course I call Eric up the next day and say, I had a lucid dream, and he's into the Seth material and has had some lucid dreaming experience and understood that. But it didn't quite melt his anger. This is now, what, 18 years later, and it's still an open issue with improbabilities. My stepmother is still alive on friendly terms, and who knows how that will play out. Stay tuned for another story. <laughs> <laughs> so, coming back full circle, perhaps, Seth Network International starts in 93. Reality Change was a key link to get that magazine. What was that, a quarterly, right? Every, every three months. It was just wonderful to know there were other Sethies out there. And during this period, I had two visits to the Hill House with Bob Terry, where I met Rob and Laurel Davies at the time. And it was just wonderful uh, to, to be there, sit in James Rocker, see the paintings, see the books, the manuscripts, and everything else. In 94, Seth Kitty passes on, just shy of his 18th birthday. And the lyric to Rooney is something that always comforts me. And it comforted me when Seth passed. It comforted me when Kaiser passed. And it's something that I've always recommended on the email list when someone was mourning the loss of a pet. The lyric to Rooney is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I have it marked in my copy of Dialogues. I just want to share that with you. Norm Friedman's Bridging Science and Spirit is a seminal work for me. I had never even thought of that as a theme in my life. I had never heard of the perennial wisdom. Again, Castaneda and drugs. That was my only introduction. And of course, the philosophy of Ken Wilber at this time. So that was a very, very key conceptual turning point, just the theme of Bridging Science and Spirit. I bought that book, by the way for my uh, staff, several staff members, and I even sent a copy to the executive director of the Exploratorium, Rob Semper in San Francisco, who was a friend, colleague of mine. He never responded, you know, acknowledged that he got it, but uh, the Exploratorium is, is, in my opinion, the best science museum in the country in San Francisco. Okay, moving on then. I quit the science museum in February of 97. And I have a very important dream. And I'm just going to read this for my dream journal. I came awake looking at myself, or more likely a representation of my greater self. And I asked very intently, staring into this mirror of my very soul, who am I? And this happened spontaneously. I became lucid. I'm there. There's a reflection. And something in me looks at that and says, who am I? The intent of the question was to focus this mirror image and get some greater understanding of my inner connection. I must also admit that I grew slightly scared of what I might find. And this is a common experience early on. You come into something new and a fear reaction kicks in and that will shut down the experience, which it did. At this point, it put a damper on things and the fear actually served to shrink the environment or my perception of it. And then I grew anxious, so I turned around and I dove or flew, which is a common action. I will take this dive forward and fly through the wall and return to the dream state. So when I woke up and I'm writing in my journal, I added some connections here that it was a highly concentrated focus. I woke up cold. It's in the 40s this morning, even though it was May. Went to the bathroom. I mulled over that damn question, and its answer still eludes me this morning. Also, the mirror image I stared at was a Caucasian male, but definitely not me. And it was just the surface tremor of a throng of many others that I sensed were hidden or implied just around, under, and back of that image. Who am I? I queried my inner self. The multiple personas implied in the mirror of my very soul is a clue, but I feel like such an amateur. My search continues. Who was at Elmira in 97? Just a show of hands. So I just I just <coughs> coined that word Seth stock. I've never heard anyone use it. Maybe it's been there and I've forgotten that. It's certainly possible. But uh, given that it was the 40th anniversary this summer of Woodstock, and we are the Woodstock generation, it was a wonderful uh, event. It was Rob's 70th birthday. It was a full moon. It was a summer solstice. There were all these wonderful 400 Seth readers together. The largest gathering probably thus far. There was a destiny meeting in room 106 where we met Mary Ennis, who channels Elias. 
It was the first time I'd ever seen anyone channel. In all these experiences, I had been totally isolated and alone. So what did we do? We loaded up the truck and we moved to Castaic, California. That is, high desert, dry heat, and occasional movie stars. We moved out there, and Canute asked me this question this morning. How did you end up in Castaic? Why would anyone, Why would anyone <laughs> live in Castaic? The last truck stop on Interstate 5 before it goes up into the Los Padres National Forest. So two nights before we leave, I have lucid dreams, which is always just an image that the inner self is communicating more clearly to me. And when I got there, the first night I slept in the new house, I had a lucid dream where Jane greeted me. And that really surprised me. But that, to me, was a solidification that my path, my journey, was on the right direction. And so this started a period of intense dream and meditation work. We're going to rest the brain cells for a few seconds.